Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of American Grit with myself, Tim Jensen. And we've been talking a lot lately about mental health in America. And we've been delivering some fantastic episodes to you, covering a wide array of different things in the realms of mental health, uh, mental health treatment and all different modalities uh, that go along with that. Today's guests, we're going to continue on this conversation. And we have a, a very special individual that has an incredible background and incredible backstory uh, in the work that she's doing in the state of Missouri as a elected official, a uh, member of the Missouri State Senate. I would like to introduce to you today, Holly Thompson Rader. Uh, she's put forward several several bills and has done an incredible amount, uh, amount of work within the state of Missouri on domestic violence and uh, things of that nature. And we're going to give her an opportunity to tell you all about it at home, uh, the things that she's involved in and the work that she's doing in the state of Missouri towards mental health and finding new alternative modalities of treatment, as well as decriminalizing and ending the silly war on drugs that has put in so many people into prison for long periods of times needlessly. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Holly Thompson Rader. Thank you for having me on. This is so super exciting. Yes, ma'am. Well, yeah, we met, uh, well, geez, I don't even can't remember how long it's been, but, um, you know, the work that we've been doing in Missouri, uh, has our path, our paths have crossed. Yes. Uh, and you know, our, our, we first started there during COVID and talking about, uh, uh, alternative modalities of treatment, uh, specifically in the realms of psilocybin, before special sessions of Congress there. And, um, you know, that has led us to you yes. and uh, some of the work that you've been doing. So, you know, if you can be so kind and tell everybody at home and is listening a little bit about yourself and the, and the work that you've been in, uh, involved in. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so I'm not your typical person who you find in office politician and i'm sure everybody probably says that but i really am not so i um you know my mother struggled with mental illness i grew up very poor we moved over 30 times from the end of my third grade to the beginning of my 10th grade when i had to quit school we were in a bad car accident and so i had to quit school to help take care of her and my little sister so i was 15 i quit school i also married my 21 year old boyfriend and was pregnant four months later. And so I really had to look at my life and say, okay, I'm headed to give my child the exact life that I've been wanting out of so badly. And, you know, with all of the moves, you know, when things would go south for my mama, we would just hop a Greyhound bus and go to the next place. And, you know, lots of mama's boyfriends in and out of the house. She was married five times, um, sexual abuse, horrific domestic violence and drug addiction. My sister was an addict by the time she was 16. She married her dealer. Um, he was 39 when she was 16. And um, my cousin died at 39 from long-term opioid abuse. You know, I grew up around it. Um, drug addiction in the trailer parks and the projects where I lived, it, you know, to me, it was just well, hopelessness. You know, there's not a lot of, of things to hope for, for a better tomorrow. This is life, you know? Yeah. And um, that's how I grew up. Well, when I realized I've got to get out of this to get my daughter out of this, I put my head down and I worked. And, you know, I did jobs. I was a hotel maid. I was a waitress. I wasn't a very good waitress. I have dyslexia, so I was terrible at it. Um, but I, I worked my way up. And, and out of poverty, I, I got the help that I need. I took GED classes at night so that I could get my GED, started college classes. It took me 17 years to get my degree because I did it while I was raising a family and working full time and trying to be an example for my children. I raised them in church. Um, I started working at 19 in the uh, payment processing room of a cable company and just opening mail and processing it. And, you know, when I left there 14 years later, I was one of the top directors, director of government affairs. And that was from working my way up. Some jobs I applied for, interviewed for, I got some of them I didn't. Um, but I just worked really hard and, and tried to provide the example in the home that I didn't have. I wanted my kids to have, you know, the Walton's home. So my kids were raised in a two-parent home with a mama up in their business all the time. You know, I knew addiction. Um, I kept my kids away from it. 
I'm the crazy mom that when you come in at night, you have to kiss me goodnight so that I can smell your breath. And if you, you know, if it smells like you've been drinking, I pulled the breathalyzer out of my nightstand. You know, I'm, that's who I am. And, um, but my daughter cut her thumb at work at 17. They sent her to, she was wait, waitressing, um, opening a bag of okra. They sent her to the emergency room, uh, stitched it up, and gave her a script of Lorisets. Mm. That's what started 13 years of deep addiction. And she went from, she was 17, she was already accepted into college, into a physical therapy program. She was an excellent student. Um, but, you know, the 30-something-year-old mama to the 17-year-old didn't understand what the 54-year-old mama knows now, and that said our DNA has a lot to do with it. I mean, there's just so much more than, you know, back then, all that I had ever seen of addiction was hopelessness. My daughter w did not have hopelessness. She had a family. She had um, opportunity that I never had. You know, she, she had a car. She had a job. She had great grades. But she moved from pills to meth, um, heroin, bath salt, shooting up, you name it. Um, 13 years, my grandson being born with opioids in his system, me taking custody of him right before he turned two. And so, you know, when I ran for office, which was super weird for me, but as uh, director of government affairs of the cable company, I had started getting asked to come and speak before a committee in Jeff City at the State House on some bills that were affecting our industry. Well, you know, I'm pretty white and black about things. I mean, I'm, I get up there and it's like, I felt as though everybody was fighting over things that didn't matter. You know, here, I, I knew what it felt like to live from paycheck to paycheck and to get myself out of that and to fight for my kids to have good teachers, to have good, you know, to, to have opportunity. And then you go up to Jefferson City and you see politicians fighting about stuff that really doesn't make a difference at the kitchen table, right. you know? And it was so disappointing. Um, so I, I decided I was going to run for office and, you know, and I had people wanting to, you know, that told me they're like, do you really want to do this when you've got a daughter that's, and I'm like, yeah, the number of people that I know that are in the same situation that I am, the, the number of grandparents raising their grandchildren that I have met. Yes, yes, we need somebody in office that's talking about these things that are real, that people are actually struggling with and find and trying to find some solutions for better outcomes. And so I ran for office um, in the state house one. So I was a, a representative. I was in the House of Reps for eight years and then ran for Senate. And so now I'm a senator and I worked on um, the opioid epidemic for 10 years. My first session is um, I, I was fighting with people in my own party, you know, because of some of the things that th they were saying things like, oh, well, I was working on the prescription drug monitoring program. Missouri was the only state that didn't have it, didn't make any sense. Our physicians could not look to see what their patients were taking. So they could prescribe something that somebody had just gotten at the ER a week ago, right? right. So I was fighting for this, and I had folks in my party saying, hey, this is a big government database. Well, it's, it's an electronic medical record. But the back and forth is what made me realize, I felt like God just really quickened in my spirit. You know, Holly, don't get mad. I mean, I'm a writer. It's like you've got to help them understand. They don't know what they don't know. They've not seen the things you've seen growing up. And so you've got to paint a picture for them and let them put a face to it. And so that's when I started writing my memoir and got a book deal a couple of years ago. And um, and it's been a huge blessing, you know, and it does. It shows that there are many of us that start from a different starting block. You know that, yeah. you know. And um, but, but the majority of the people that get elected, both sides of the aisle, they haven't had that type of life. And so how can they fight for that community when they've never experienced it. Yeah.
Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. You know, we talk, you know, a lot about uh, opioid addiction uh, within the program here, and you know, the work that uh, is going on in Missouri is, is very is very substantial. In 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 those conversations, you know, we just finished a program with you and uh, Aaron McMullen, Representative Aaron McMullen, uh, about know, two weeks ago, that right. was really focused on some of the opioid ab- uh, abatement opportunities that are happening within the state of Missouri right now, and that is you know really being predicated from uh, what was happening in the state of Kentucky, right? Um, yes. And we all know how that uh, has collapsed on itself, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, when you see a good idea, you don't want to see a good idea go to to naught, right? That's right. And in such, in such an epidemic, I mean, to look at – to look at how psilocybin, the outcomes, and look, when I was first approached with this, I'm like, heck no, no, I'm not, you know, no, I'm trying, I'm trying to stop this, yeah. you know, abuse of drugs. And they're like, Holly, just read the data. And look, I'm a facts person, you know, I'm not, I, I didn't have the luxury of, of getting to, <clears throat> you know, run by, my life by my feelings i had to do it by okay what's going to work what's not we're doing what works yeah and um looking at the data it's like this is it's natural it's the outcomes is amazing and i mean and yes you know with any with any type of of drug trial or any type of of clinical study you're going to have, you know, a little bit of negative or or some a lot of negative, but this showed very little downside. Right. Amazing gains yeah. and and positive outcomes and it's like if we can get this done, imagine the number of people with chronic depression, which is all through my family. Um substance use disorder all through my family. Um and our veterans, what they've experienced, PTSD, and the rates of suicide. I mean, why would we not put some money into this and actually get the help that some people need? Yeah, and I think that's a, a, a great segue into speaking of the current uh, epidemic that's happening within the state of Missouri, right? There's a high suicide rate that is you know, happening you know, uh, in you know, comparison to other states in the union, uh, Missouri right. is up there, right? Right. Uh, the, the, the top, what, top 15 states in, in the we union? Are. Um, you know, so, you know, is, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on there. You have, you know, the substantial opioid uh, addiction within the state. Uh, you have overprescribing of, of these uh, pharmaceuticals that are we happening. We absolutely do. And, and that's, you know, of course, led into fentanyl. Mm-hmm. And the fentanyl deaths are, you know, certainly hugely increasing. And um, and that's, you know, being driven by the opioid addiction. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when we when we when we're, we're kind of framing that into perspective here and truly understanding that, OK, there, there is a big problem that's happening on the ground. Uh, and you know we have we have these alternative modalities and these opportunities, right? right? Uh, and uh, and I and I, I you know I think it's really you know fantastic of of, of you and Representative McMullen to, to step into the arena uh, uh, arena on this. Uh, uh, we've interviewed uh, Representative Lacasio. Uh, yeah, I believe that's his last name. Um, I'm, I'm terrible with my memory, so I apologize. That's for pretty good. It's Lavasco, <laughs> but I, I I have trouble remembering it, and I've served with him for years. Yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a great man. He's a good um, guy. And you know, we and we started uh, you know really that conversation of of psilocybin uh, with uh, some great individuals like Ethan Thampy, um, you know, and 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 really changing the narrative within the state of Missouri, right? Right. Um, you know, uh, I think was it uh, last week. Um, you know, time stamp this episode. Uh, you guys, uh, both you and McMullen, have bills come out of committee unanimous in, in, in their decisions. Right. Could you tell us a little bit about that. You know, and that is a lot to do with you guys' advocacy efforts. So last year I carried this bill also, and it is to allow a clinical study for psilocybin. Um, last year, we did have it to where it, it it wasn't narrowly defined as to who could do the study. Um, many 
representatives the last day, you know, kind of came unhinged and said, oh, my gosh, y'all are trying to uh, legalize mushrooms. It's like, OK, no, that's that's an oversimplification of what Correct. this bill does. This is a clinical study. It's in in a clinic in a therapeutic operation here. Um, medical is you're not driving it, you know, to the pharmacy window or to the place where, you know, you can pick up pot gummies and they're handing, you know, your psilocybin out the window. No, this is done in a clinical setting with a therapist. And, um, and so this year, so we lost it last year, this year, when we came back, we really started working on some of those same representatives that tanked it last year. And they said that they, they probably w won't vote yes, but they will sit down and not make hay about it. Yeah. If we narrowly tailor it to veterans and let, you know, if, if veterans want to do this study, then let's see what the outcomes are. Yeah. And you guys had been up advocating for it. And so it's, you know, it's not as as broad as I'd like to see it. I'd like to see it for our first responders. I'd like to see it for our folks with chronic depression, you know, yeah. that's driving the suicide rates. Um, but I know that once we get this done and we have these these outcomes, because there's so many studies already done mm -hmm. that already show such positive outcomes. I know that when we have the Missouri study, so it's a the bill calls for a M Missouri Medical University to do this this study in conjunction with the state. Yeah, and you know, as I understand it, you know, you know we're working alongside you and Mr. McMullen and Macasio. Um, is that Wash U is one of the leading universities in the country uh, that is taking on this endeavor to truly understand psychedelics in the application of mental health? Right, they're all right. They're already doing some studies. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yes, and have been. Yeah. You know, when, when, when you know, so it's. I think it's really important to kind of frame that in a perspective because you know. It's not like we're going out there and saying, hey, uh, we just legalized this and you know, we, should be grow we should all be growing it in our backyard. <laughs> that is not what anybody's no. saying here, right? No. This is, you know, these are, these are big psychedelics, right? You, you right. just can't like, you know, eat a, eat, eat a couple grams of these things and, uh, you know, you get behind a motor vehicle and just drive into the sunset. Absolutely not. No. Like, these need to be done in controlled settings. And you know, we talk about that a lot on this program because it's absolutely important, right? That, it's you know, a part these, of it. This is, this is, the the you know the magic is not the the medicine itself right the the magic is coming with the the understanding of integration right uh, and the medical practicing of good therapy that is happening pre during and post uh, these applications to where you know you're sitting with a, a clinical psychologist you're having extraordinarily deep conversations after or before, during, and after this uh, psychedelic event that is essentially reconnecting uh, neuroplasticity, you know, uh, building, building back, you know, areas of the brain that have been damaged and essentially giving you a new opportunity to recreate behavior. Like that, that is what we're talking about here, right? You right. Know, in the, in the, in the schemes of, you know, when we talk about treatment-resistant depression, you know, anecdotally, you know, we can say uh, I have I have I have selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors in one hand, and I have a uh, a breakthrough, uh, you know, uh, a breakthrough modality of treatment in the other, yeah. right? That has a higher efficacy rate of treatment than the SSRI does. And you're telling me that I only have to do it one time? Right. What are, what are we talking about here? Exactly. And and all the side effects that you have from pharmaceuticals, you know? And when, and and just like opioids, when you take them, you have to take more. Mm -hmm. And you take more. And you take more. And it, and it ruins the reward system in your brain. It hijacks your reward system, and it no longer works the way it's supposed to. And that is why you have incredibly deep deep dives into depression when your reward system is off yeah. and and to have medication a natural remedy 
that has such that is showing such promise, why are we not doing this across the United States? Yeah, yeah. Veterans absolutely. that came and testified in committee said that they've had to go to Mexico. That is awful. That is a shame that yeah. our veterans that fought for us, that y'all fought for us to have the freedom that we have. And you and and to have the health care that you need, you have to go to Mexico. Right. Mexico, or you're going off into dangerous places. I mean, you know, I'm glad Central that America. you can find places, but that's shameful of us. I mean, we, we need to have we need to have all things that are that are showing promise available to help our veterans. Yeah. And and there's a lot of conversation happening right now in the United States, right? You know, you're you're putting attention uh, uh within the state of Missouri. Your bill is specifically labeled SB 768. Yes. Uh and it's a, a it's a monumental piece of legislation that modifies provisions relating to the alternative therapies and treatment including psilocybin, right? So, yes. you know, you're you're creating an opportunity to where people uh can access this through clinical trials and cl- clinical studies. While also decriminalizing this to where if you're, you know, you know, again, it goes into this failed war on drugs uh, that has put more people into prison. Um, and, uh, and let's call it what it is. And it, it has done nothing to solve the drug problem. Right. You know, we can look across any major urban environment in the United States today and see what fentanyl has done to this country. Right. And, you know, we can see what um, opioids have done to people in this country. You know, look at, you know, the the states of uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio, uh, West Virginia. West Virginia. Right. Those are just destroyed economically right. due to the, the falling of the coal industry. Generational trauma that has happened, uh, you know, just by the subjugation of, of the peoples in, uh, right. in those states. And we just keep serving them more opioids, right? Know, and then they say, right. then we say, hey, you're addicted to opioids. We've got, we've got the answer for you. Let's give you another opioid I to know. get you off the opioid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? It, right? It's madness. And, and, and back to when we were, you were mentioning incarceration. How many people do we have in jail for hurting themselves? Right. Because of addiction. Like, that's why they're in jail. And right. it's. That that's not helping anything. I mean, we in Missouri we have we do have mental health courts, and those have been tremendous. And yeah. we we have started doing some things differently. Um, but the fact that that across the U.S. we we are put still putting people in jail for harming themselves, b- becoming addicted instead of treating addiction like a like the brain disease that it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, we were, we were talking before the show, um, you know, we're pretty close in age. You know, there was a time in America when, when we were younger that there was, you know, these mental health facilities, these these, these places that were state funded, right? Right. And, you know, where have all those things gone, right? And where has, where has been, you know, this, you know, but that's a, this, this asks a, a unique question is like, is the, is the is the government, state, local, federal, responsible for the mental health of of its community? I don't know what the Constitution says on that. Right. But at the same time, you know, since we've abdicated, you know, a responsibility there, and now we're seeing the zombies, you know, walking right. around everywhere, we've, we've really shot ourselves in the foot. And it's it's less expensive. It's a lot less expensive to get someone into recovery and therapy that they can do while they're working mm. around their job while they're raising their own kids in Missouri, our foster care system outpaces other States, our size. And it is because we have on average over 6,000 children that cycle in and out each year from substance abuse homes. All of that affects the health of a state. Yeah, And so even if you're, if you're, just fiscally conservative and say you're not, you know, someone who's worried about human capital. Um, certainly that should still perk your ears up, you know, that it is less expensive to get someone the help that they need through recovery and treatment. And these new modalities that we're talking about could even 
could even be more fast paced in getting people back on their feet into a healthy, happy lifestyle. I agree. I agree. I've heard data, you know, especially when I was sitting in the conversations in the state of Kentucky uh, with uh, the uh, great group of associates working on this issue mm -hmm. that, you know, there's been some figures passed, you know, on how, how monetarily this works, right? So when you're talking about an opioid uh, abatement program, um, you know, uh, for an individual, you're looking in excess of $138,000 of treatment that is being dumped into an individual, right? Wow. Uh, with the likelihood of greater than 50% that this person is going to relapse and go back into a state of use. $138,000 on a 50% chance of it actually being successful, Gosh. right? Then you think about, you know, uh, modalities that are emerging like Ibogaine and psilocybin. Uh, you know, I'll stick to Ibogaine really specifically on this particular example. You know, we we're talking for... An administration of uh, Ibogaine, right? Uh, you have a, a efficacy greater than 80, 86% on first dose. I was just reading. I was just reading this. Right? It's, it's amazing, yeah. right? Yeah. 93% on second dose, and it costs less than $20,000 to administer. Most of the money that is being spent is to make sure that you have the proper medical staff on site to make sure these individuals are going through the process uh, the, the correct way. Because, you know, and to be tr completely transparent, Ibogaine has some uh, risk factors, right, for cardiac. I did. I read that, right, right? Some, some of the heart risk factors. Exactly. So, yeah. I mean, there is screening that needs to be done on that. And that's, right. again, that's that's the, the appropriate approach, right? Right. Um, but, you know, again, as a, as, as, some, as a politician, right, you know, when you've got something in front of you that says, hey, we've got a modality of treatment that, uh, you know, uh, will cost insurance companies $138,000 with a, a very low efficacy rate. Uh, we're probably going to have to put this person back into some treatment, you know, three, four times in their lifetime before they're ever really healed from it. Uh, or or and, and, and keep them on a medicine for the rest of their life. Right. Right. Or we can apply, you know, this, um, you know, psychedelic from Africa. Uh, that has the capability of of curing an individual, largely first case, and you know, the data supports that they don't ever go back. I was going to say the testimony was incredible. Right? It's like, oh my gosh! Again, what are we talking about here? <laughs> right. right, right. And and I have just been encouraging the representatives that have talked to me about this because these studies are online. You know that that these teaching schools have done, mm -hmm. and they're online. They show the data. It is, I mean, it's black and white. This is not, these are clinical studies that show these outcomes. Like, you have to look at that. These are not the psychedelics of the 70s. Yeah. This is different. And and you have to look at that. Don't just say no. Look into what we're talking about here. And, and then how can you deny someone something that is life changing which then turns into as as someone who came from substance abuse generation after generation after generation this is isn't just life changing it's generational changing yeah 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 absolutely you know uh and you know we think about you know missouri uh you know there's some generational aspects of uh, inside the state of missouri um that you know speak into you know some of these addictions that are happening and you know uh we have to we have to come to terms with these things right we have to acknowledge them because you know to your point like at this stage in the game, we're in the 21st century. Everybody has the access to this thing called the World Wide Web. Right. Right. Uh, where white papers are published on the daily. Right. Peer yes. reviewed. Yes. And, you know, you, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can go anywhere to find these things. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and at this point, it's like, is it safe to say that like, if, if you can't just say, oh, well, I don't know about it or it, it, it's ignorance at this point. Like it's, right. it's ignorance that you that, you know, as a as a as somebody that's in a, a position of politics, 
that if you're on the opposing side of it and you're like, I refuse to look at the data. Right. Like, what are you, are you representing your people? Are you representing the, the, the constituency in the way, in, in an honest way of saying, you know what? I have to, I may personally have uh, objections to what this modality of treatment can provide. But as a, uh, a servant of the people that have put me into this position, it is my responsibility to do the due diligence. Right. You and, have to look at both sides of an issue and you have to delve into it. And when, especially when it comes to health care, you have to delve into the data. And if, you've, if you vote no on something that you've not looked at the data, and shame on you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And you know, let's, let's talk about a little bit of that data, right? Um, and you know, we were really excited about you know, uh, the, the, this last conference that we had and you know, some of the conversations we were having there. You know, and we spoke a little bit about you know, uh, these SSRIs and the overprescribing right, of SSRIs. Yeah. Um, you know, and the data that is coming out uh, that you can find at the University of Oxford, University of London, right? The Lancet. Uh, all these different uh, European uh, you know, research groups that are saying, hey, guys, um, we're wrong. Uh, these SSRIs have uh, not been doing anything for uh, what we believe that they're to be addressing. And, in fact, they're causing damage. I mean, your episode on this blew me away. I, I've, I've watched this. I've watched it from the eyes of a child and, and the eyes of a mother like, yeah. and sister. I've watched this and never connected those dots until I watched your your podcast on it. It was just so eye opening. Yeah, it's uh, it's and it's really sad, right? Because you know, and I, I use this word a lot. And I've been using it quite liberally in this conversation. Uh, it's 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 criminal. It's criminal. It's really criminal, right? When you look at, you know, again, like some of the monies and how these monies have worked, right? I go back to this conversation uh, or uh, this uh, example of Endeavor, uh, the, the group that has put together this amazing drug called Suboxone, right? Um, and, you know, Suboxone does have its, its um, benefits. And it's helped, right? it's helped people. It's helped a lot of you people. You know, it's helped a right? lot of people, right. Um, but at the same time, you know who it's helped the most? Yeah. The, the the executives of uh, of Endeavor, right? Um, you know, when when they brought this this mo- this this medicine to market, there was only 160,000 uh, practitioners in the United States who were able to prescribe this thing, right? And it was controlled, it was regulated. Uh, what did Endeavor do? Well, they said, "Oh man, this is this is really slowing down our ability to make profits." So, um, they hired a couple lobbyists. They went to Washington, D.C. They petitioned the government and the NIH and a few other of these um, uh, boards, uh, scientific boards in, uh, that are in the federal government. And the next thing you know, three million doctors in the United States are able to prescribe Suboxone. And, you know, in year one or uh, year one after that uh, proliferation, uh, Endeavor puts over $350 million in revenue on the board. Like... What do we, this is crazy to me. Yeah. And you know, and, and full disclosure, I've been someone like medication assisted treatment. I am, you know, whatever's working for you, whatever works for you, get on your feet. Let's get you back to work. Be able to take care of your babies, yeah. you know, and, um, and medication assisted treatment is, is one of those things that I've been like, Great. If this is what works now, my daughter didn't. She, um, she's, and I didn't mention that she's been clean ten years now. Best mama I know. She's an amazing woman, strong woman. Um, she didn't. You know, she she was able to. We were able to get her into a location that worked on the mental health side of it, which yeah. is something that I had not done because I didn't know. Um, we. Had, we're going into into um, treatment thirty days, you know, doing the whole cycle, and then a few months later she'd be back again. And we did that for years. Um, when I started learning about the medication assisted treatment, at first I was like, "No, we're not going to move from one drug to the next." And then I started seeing, okay, well, some people are, are able to get on this, and they're able to get off of you know of of the oxy and the all the other things, um, but and. Honestly, until I 
started listening to your podcast and started seeing, well, one, these other modalities that we could absolutely be doing that right. are natural, um, but two, the uptick of that and how that process has worked. And, you know, I mean, we've, we've got to be better. Yeah. We, we have we have the science to be better right we have we have the science and, and more importantly we have a responsibility to each other right in That's my opinion. right yes and and to and to show people that you don't you don't have to be tied to a drug yeah right. that there's help without that being your life and um it's just it you know there's it's it's such a rabbit hole trying trying to get off of opioids but i mean things like psilocybin and ibogaine i mean there there is hope there is natural hope yep there i i I firmly believe that right and you know as we've had these conversations and we talked to so many different people um, you know, uh, I think you, you, you've talked about it a little bit yourself is, you know, the, the traumatic uh, past of your childhood, right? And the things that you've experienced, like, um, you know, we have, we have such a problem in the United States, um, you know, when it comes to our mental health, right? Uh, you know, we have sexual assault that is happening from top to bottom. Uh, right. Age, you know, it you know, doesn't matter. You know, the age doesn't matter. The the sex doesn't matter. Right. Um, you know, the, we're we we have some sick people right in this country that you know it happened to them, and it, the person that did it to them it happened to them, and it, you go back and it's generational, right? And Absolutely. this is how it's all happening. You know, and then you know, here we are in today's society where you know the 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 family nucleus is is not what it used to be thirty even thirty years ago. If you go back sixty years ago, it's it's like we're reading different books. Right, <laughs> we're not even right. in the same book anymore. Yes. Um, you know, and it, it, it and it's 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 really sad to 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 see how you know um, pharmaceutical companies have taken advantage of that, right? Because you know, they're not they're not treating the root of the issue they're treating the symptom right, right? Uh, and then you know we have the the strategies of removing you know state funded medical facilities uh, to a large degree um, and and leaving people to kind of just sit and figure out their own mental health we have so much untreated mental health and And, you know, another area that we're lacking so much in this is, you know, for for 10 years now, for 12 years now, I've been saying, and and others have, I'm not, you know, others have across the U.S., but your your mental health is just as important as your physical health. Mm -hmm. You can't, you know, when when you have, um, when you break an arm, you can see that, right? Um, And you go and get it taken care of. Well, your mental health is you. You can't see the injury um, in your brain, but it's there. You know it's there. Get help. Reach out for help. Make a call. Get an appointment. Get help. Now, I have folks that call my office um, because you know I've spoke all over the state on this for over a decade um, because I'm just very honest. Um, it's. You know, not a common story for somebody in politics. I'm very honest. I know that God gave me a microphone. I'm not going to keep my mouth shut. And so now people are calling me saying, Holly, you've been saying, you know, for all these years to call and get help. Well, I've called and it's two months before I can get in. Yeah. And it's like, okay, now we have... We have got to get behavioral health specialists, therapists. We've got to focus on getting them in the pipeline. You know, when we had a shortage of nurses, when shortages of of other things, we've helped in school. We've helped say, hey, if you go work in, if you'll finish school, go work in this area. You know, different companies have given grants and that type of thing to pay off their school. We've got to start focusing on Okay, now we have a, we are at a crisis in our shortage. 
of of workers that can help with mental health. And yeah. so we've we have so much untreated mental health. We've got to get people in the pipeline to help with this and we need to we need to start funding these studies to, for these treatments that aren't tying you to a medication for the rest of your life. Right. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, some of these medications, as we've we've covered in other programs, you know, increase the suicidal ideations. They do. By massive basis points. They do. And it's right there. On, and then the package tells you that. Right. Yeah. The black know? box yeah. uh, labeling. And, you know, then then I can, you know, unfold this this tiny little card that will span across this entire desk and be like, oh, all right. Well, it's going to take me about six months to figure and out. And a magnifying glass. <laughs> and a magnifying glass <laughs> to, to truly read it. Um, you know, and, but, but it, it goes back to what we've been saying is that, you know, there's, there doctors in today's medical, um, uh, uh in, in today's medical practice, um, are, I gotta be very careful what I say here. Right. Uh, because I know, I don't want to be crass, but I, I, I want to be crass because it's, we're, we're past the point of, of, of being respectable about it, you know, is that you have a lot of doctors in this country that will just write scripts, that will not ask the right questions because right. they are not psychiatrists. That's right. They do not understand mental health. These are doctors that understand basic general practices, right? Your, your, your doctor that you go to, you know, uh, and get your blood drawn is the same guy that's going to, you know, today write you a, a prescription for Paxil. That will put right. you in a position of, of uh, suicidal ideations right. with a higher propensity than, say, I don't know, placebo. <laughs> right. And and I found out working on the prescription drug monitoring program, and I don't know if this is still the case, but this was the case 10 years ago, is that physicians, the requirement for substance use disorder, for them to know anything, the education they were getting on addiction was almost nothing in school. Yeah. So doctors were were graduating and doing their rotations and everything without any training in in addiction. When that is ex exploding. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And so, yeah. I mean, we have to have we have to have physicians, practitioners that understand what people are going through. Yeah. And and know how to help them out. Exactly. You know. I think. We'll, the, the, the one silver lining that came out of COVID was that we can no longer hide behind the mask that we've all put on our faces of saying, I'm okay. Right. You right. Know? And, you know, I, and I'm not, I don't want to be negative either and, and say that like, you know, all, you know, all of our program that we talk about here is just like, Oh, it's so sad. It's this, that, and the other, you know, you know, we, you know there's some really great things that are happening. There's a hope, world. right? I mean, hope, the right? thing that, that what we're talking about on, on this psilocybin and the Ibogaine is that we have natural remedies out yeah. here that we need to explore. Like other people are exploring them and coming and showing these great outcomes. Let's get on the ball. Let's yep. do this. Absolutely. I mean, this is this is helping people. Yep. And that I mean, there's hope. So let's move towards it. That's right. Um, you know, in, in speaking of that, you know, we got a lot of information. You know, the psychedelic train is moving at a high rate of speed within this country. Um, you know, I've just read an article earlier this week that the FDA will be descheduling de de MDMA. I read that also, right? right? Uh, and yeah. That's, and that's a incredible, in, an incredible advancement. You, you know, we've got ketamine that is happening uh, across the United States. Uh, six sessions of, a ket uh, of ketamine treatment. Um, it, with extremely high efficacy rates for individuals that are suffering from, uh, again, treatment-resistant depression, like it's changing their lives, right? We yeah, right, and and the more that we have, and especially with the FDA making some movements on this, which is incredible, and I'm, I mean, you guys' advocacy is has been tremendous, um, but to have to have people be able to have this other option over here. I mean, let folks choose. Right. This is America. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that we're free. That's right. Let folks choose what's best for them, what they want to do. Absolutely. Now, you know, we talk a, a lot about the the modalities, um, but you know, 
one of the things that we need to be thinking about as the FDA and the DEA are, are, are in the positions now that they're making some of these uh, decisions is infrastructure, right? The infrastructure of what the network would look like once these modalities become ex- far more accessible than what they are today, right? Um, you know, you and I, you know, we've had some really great conversations about, you know, the importance of clinical uh, applications. Right. Um, and, and, that, and, and it is, again, extremely important. Nobody I know is advocating of just making this stuff street legal and you walk around and, you know, everybody's Nobody on mushrooms, that. everybody's no. on ayahuasca, right? No. Nobody's <laughs> no. But, you know, at the same time, it's, you know, what we, we want greater access to this, but there's no real infrastructures that are in place that can support these things. So, you know, I'd love to hear your opinion of what, what, what does that look like in your, your vision of, um, you know, within Missouri, what is the what is the future state of an infrastructure look like for, you know, a veteran, a first responder, you know, somebody that is, you know, a, a uniformed individual that is, you know, uh, gaining access to these modalities in the clinical setting? What does that infrastructure look like in your mind's eye? I, of course, you know, I'm not trained medical professional in any way, but. Um, on the regulation side, you know, it, it has to have guardrails. Yeah. And it has to be done in in clinic, you know, with with medical professionals. And I think that's it, right? That's that's who you need to trust. There's plenty of studies that, you know, we that are being done now yeah. across the US. And so the the amount all of that is is already, you know, science is determining that. There has to be, you know, just guardrails, but then it has to be done in a clinical setting. Yeah. And that, I mean, it's a natural remedy. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you know, we talk about integration a lot uh, within the Grunt Style Foundation, um, you know, and how, uh, again, I, I touched up a little bit on earlier in the program is, you know, you know, the medicine is just the first part of this. It's giving you the exposure of saying, hey, uh, there's a better way here, right? Uh, I can create new behaviors. I can eliminate behaviors that uh, are not, um, you know, conducive to the, the environment that I want to find myself in. Mm-hmm. Um you know, and, and that's where a lot of the real work is happening, you know, uh, is, you know, working with these licensed, trained clinical practitioners and sitting down, going through that trauma, reliving that trauma, you know, uh, through conversation and then, you know, having the exposure with the medicine and facing it in, in, a, in a way that, you know, is is unlike any conventional treatment that you would have in just a, a standard sit down with your psychiatrist or right. mental health. Right, individual. it's a process. Yep. And um, and I had read, I think it was a, I think it was a Navy SEAL that um, had talked about his experience through this, and it was it was a process. It was a beforehand therapy sessions, Mm -hmm. then going through the process with that therapist there, walking you through what's happening in your mind. And, and as all of this is churning out and the things being remembered from 30 years ago or 40 years ago or two years ago yeah, and processing that with that medical professional there with you. And then the after and, and staying on, what what you and your therapist has put together as the plan that's right for you. Right. Well, you know, I think that uh, that that's absolutely the right step forward, right? We have to you know, look at these things and, um, and, again, create this infrastructure of opportunity of, you know, these doing it the right way, having these conversations, Having these clinical aspects of 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 the opportunity of gaining the medicine, but more importantly, doing the work with the with the facilitator of, right. of all the the meat, right? The, yeah. the the real stuff, and and then you know, then holding yourself accountable, right, to right. those new, those new behaviors, um, and that's that's where the rubber meets the road, right? Uh, because I'll, it's I'll, not just just taking a medicine right. and that you know, and once again covering up masking. 
what you've, you know, kind of pushed down in there and locked away. Yeah. It's it's actually getting that out of you. Right. Resolving resolving it and being okay with it. Right. You that's know? right. And yes. that's uh that's, that's a, where a lot of you know I, I think about like the military, I think about first responders a lot. You know, a lot of the you know what I've I've come to understand with the with the, the military aspects of this stuff uh and the veteran community is that you know when you talk to these individuals, you know, uh, there's a lot of sadness and, you know, um, individuals that have not completed all the seven stages of grief, right? And these, right. these are real circumstances. Um, but the large majority that I've seen is, uh, you know, a lot of these people are experienced in medicine and then they're, they're processing things that, they, that happened in their childhood, right, to, you know, and that's what led them to join the military or to be a police officer is like, I'm going to join, I'm going to join something that's bigger than myself right. to where I will never allow what happened to me happen to somebody else. That's exactly right. right. And I find that to be so intriguing that, you know, of just the, how the human psyche uh, works to like, I will do this because of this and I will live my, the rest of my life uh, and uh, to better somebody else's outcome because of what happened to me. Like that is incredible selflessness, right? But at the end of the day, those selfless individuals are never putting the attention on themselves to get the help that they need. To process and they're just living that. a life of torment. Right. Right. Uh, because, hey, I, I'm, you know, tomorrow's going to be a better day, right? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll get up tomorrow and I'm going to help six people. Uh, I'm going to pull nine people out of a house of, that's on fire or whatever the case may be. Right. Um, but there's never that moment where that individual is saying, but I'm going to spend 10 minutes thinking about myself. I'm going to spend 10 minutes, you know, pros, you know, working on the things that I need to be thinking about. Right. To, it's going to advance me as a person so I could be a better individual for somebody else. And right. there's, um, the, at, the final chapter of my book is um, is the most important one to me, and it's titled "Forgiveness," and and that's processing the things, the sexual abuse, the domestic violence, the things that that I had to live through and handle as a child. Um, and then being able to to not just hide it anymore and not think about it anymore because i'm pretty good at that you know yeah. you know i mean you hack me off enough i just put up some walls and i don't it's not that i'm mad at you it's not that i don't like you it's just that i don't think about you right yeah. and um and so i had done that with so many of the traumatic things that i'd went through as a child and it was until god really started dealing with me on forgiveness in the different areas, not, not not all at the same time. This is over the course of, you know, really long time, and I'm 54. Um, but being able, you have to be able to process that. You have to be able in order to let it go and it to not affect you anymore. And we have so many people, like you said, that, okay, they lock it away, and then they go on to make other people's lives better so that they never have to experience what they experience. And they never get to, that's always inside. And they never get to have that fleshed out. And that's a part of, in, in reading these studies, that's a part of what has been so impressive to me is that this, this medication going through um, this type of therapy with a the therapist, that stuff is coming out as you're walking through it with this therapist. And yeah. so it's a it's a fast track on pulling that out and being able to face it, forgive and move on. Yeah. I I, I absolutely agree. You know, I think you know, think about uh, a lot of the, the the issues that are facing our country right now, you know, can all go back to mental our mental health, right? I yeah. think about obesity. 
well, what do people, why do people overeat? Right. Well, they're not That's happy right. about something inside, like in, right. the, in their heart, right? So they're compensating and they're becoming obese. And the next thing you know, they're, they're you know, they've got uh, heart issues, cholesterol issues, right. diabetic issues. They're losing parts of their body because, you know, the, the sugar intake, yada, yada, yada. Um, I think about the national defense of our country because we can't field a, 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 an effective army uh, because, you know, the obesity that's happening within our country, like really? all of these things go back to one simple aspect of that's plaguing the country in its whole. And that's the mental health. It's the mental health. Right. It's and the mental health. If we do not address this, we will have bigger problems within this country. Right. And and I mean, like we talked about earlier with the suicide rates, that is not going to get better yeah. if we do not change course. Yeah. And that's what we have to do. I mean, it's we we have to start treating mental health and, and chronic depression is that driver. And and when you're coming off of opioids or the SS, SSRIs, yep. I say it wrong every time. <laughs> um, your your brain with the reward system is tanking, and you go into such a deep depression that. And you don't know that it's the medication. You don't understand that it's your brain. All that you know is that everything is awful yeah. in your world. And, you know, my I mean, my mother and my sister both were, I mean, my mother talked about suicide quite often. Um, my sister did try it once. And so it's, it's hard to explain, but, it, but the deep depression, it's like, it, you're going to be okay, but you sure don't know that. You no, do no. not know that because your brain is not allowing you to know that. And yeah. you think your whole world is ruined and and you feel like you can't get out of it. And that's when a lot of people, you know, try to get out of it. Yeah. And um, and if, and to, to have opportunity like this, I just, I hope America wakes up and takes it and stops worrying about you know, an old way of thinking and actually looks at, at what opportunity we have right in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm often reminded uh, of uh, a prophecy uh, that uh, was uh, brought forward many, many years ago. And, you know, I, I don't often get into the realms of religion or things of that nature. And, um, you know, but there's a, a prophecy that was brought uh, forward by Crazy Horse. Uh, I've the, heard you say this yeah, before the, on it's here. Yeah. <laughs> prophecy of the seventh generation, right? Yeah. And I find that, uh, you know, as I as I learn more about the work that we are doing and the, uh, the indigenous cultures here within the United States and, you know, how uh, the Red Road has, has connected cultures all the way from Alaska down to South America and the passage of medicine yeah. uh, through all of these uh, different tribes, you know, uh, I, 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 I tend to believe that Crazy Horse might have been onto something that, yeah. uh, you know, that we have gotten ourselves, uh, the, you know, into such a position here uh, in our country that um, the only way out is medicine. <laughs> and we're going to have we're going to have to go back to the, the indigenous and be like, you know, uh, we need we need this medicine. And here we are. Right. It is the here 21st century. Uh, we are exploring these these ancient medicines that have been on this planet forever. Right. Right. That's right. You know, and we talk about tobacco, the and the you know the sacred the sacred uh, relationship between the indigenous cultures and tobacco. Right is fascinating for anybody that don't know that. Just go out there and read their connection the connections with tobacco. Uh, these are all spiritual aspects, right? And that's the one thing that you find when you when you get into these uh, modalities is. You know, uh, you may not believe in God, right? You may not believe in the, 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 the dogmatic things, but you're going to, at the end of these experiences, believe that there is a creator <laughs> right. and that there is something bigger uh, out there that exists. And, you know, again, I think that is another aspect of this that we forget about is, you know, you've got, you know, this deep depression and, 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 and trauma that's happening. Uh, and then, you know, this, this um, lack of understanding or relationship with the spirit of yourself, right? And, you know, that's just creating this 
cesspool of 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 thought, of behavior, of of your body reacting, right? And you know, then then we think about you know cancer. Right? Cancer is you know uh, you know uh, it's environmental, it's stress related, right? Uh, you know, like what. Because of our, our bad mental health and all those things, are we are we adding that is that stress adding to the cancer rates in this country? Well, and we definitely know that some of the food yeah. is, you know. And, GMO and all the other things. Right. That are, and so that are right. And and so you just and and with me walking through this has been very, you know, spiritual and 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 just God giving me my book to be able to help other people, to be able to see um, so many people who grew up like me, you know, yeah. that's, that's, it's like, I want them to know that you can come through this. You can, you know, what, what, what we're raised in is not what our future has to be. We get to determine our future. Yeah. You know, God has, has opened many doors for me and, um, and I've had that healing from the Holy Spirit of just of of letting me um, get that out, flesh that out, and have the forgiveness. And 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 some people, you know, have experienced so much more than me. And and this this is a these type of modalities is a huge opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you've talked about the uh, the uh, the book a lot. Uh, yeah. What motivated you to write the book, and what is the title? So it's Cinder Girl, C I N D E R, like the black coals, you know, the cinders in yep. the fire, and um, and it's and God just put it on my heart after that first session. I mean, you know, I was raised in trailer parks, and so like I'm in heated debate with somebody on the house floor and you know i'm ready to just take my earrings out and take my pumps off and say let's go <laughs> um and god's like you can't but that's not right, right. what we're doing here and that, that, that's this. missouri tradition though <laughs> <laughs> it's like holly get out of yourself this ain't the trailer park and that you are in the house of representatives and you have got to find a way to show to Teach them what they don't know. Show them what they've never seen. And that is that many of us have just started from a different starting block. Yeah. You can't mash us into the same mold. You can't say, okay, I'm going to give you free college and you go, well, you know what? I had a baby at 16. I had to work. I had to take care of her. You know, I didn't have a mama that could. I read pamphlets. I went and got a Dr. Spock book that I traded a few of my mama's romance novels for at the book bug, you know, to teach me how, what to do with this baby that I had. We don't all have the same situation. And so often government holds people down from ever rising at their potential by trying to help them. Yeah. And so, so I wrote the book, Center Girl, and God would just wake me up at 3 a.m. and I would just start writing and writing and writing. And then over the next few weeks, I'd polish it and make it sound, you know, right. And then when I when I got this book deal and um, and it came out last year, it's been um, a, well a year ago this past August, and it has helped so many people. You know, I've I've spoken at, at I work a lot in domestic violence policy and sexual assault policy. Um, the foster care system, and um, opioid addiction, really substance use addiction, yeah. and um, and so I've I've been asked to speak all over the state at at those different events, and time after time people come up and say, "Gosh, reading your book helped me to understand my mother," or "Reading your book helped me forgive my sister or my brother," because you know when. When you don't understand that addiction is a mind, it your your brain's reward system has been changed. It's just like if you were a smoker for 30 years and you quit smoking, your heart is still damaged. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Your lungs are still damaged. You have still damaged your body. It's, it's not going to be okay the next day because you quit smoking. It is the same with these powerful narcotics. Your brain is not fixed because you now 
when they say you're clean, you have that out of your system. Your brain is not fixed. You have damaged the reward system of your brain. You have damaged the pathways of your brain. It takes time for that to heal. It takes time to get back to where you even feel good again. Yeah. It was about right at about the two-year mark when I heard my daughter Belly laugh for the first time since she had been 17. And and until then, she'd been going through the motions because she wanted to be that person for her son. But she didn't feel good, yeah. you know? And it was these powerful narcotics. And, and so writing the book... I just really detail all of that. And it's look, it's um it is raw and and honest. And so it is, you know, not for children. Um, but I talk about the things that people don't like to talk about. Yeah. And um and hopefully and I know that I have, but given others courage to to not feel ashamed, because that's a lot of it too, right? You know, you take that shame on and then you're just letting your insides, you know, crumble. Yeah. And and you don't have to. It's not your fault. If you were sexually abused, it's not your fault. Um, it's it's somebody else's fault. It's their fault. Um, it's your fault when you start projecting that on the other people. Yeah. I mean, right? like you you just it's yeah, you just can't you you have to you have to get past that, but but we have to talk about it to do it. Yeah. And that's what I love about you know the the psilocybin in in the clinical study in the therapeutic setting. Um, that's it's it's like a you know God brought me a, a really long path. It's like a fast pace. Let's get this out. Let's get with the therapist. They're going to help you walk through this. Um, and then, like you said, sometimes you need two treatments. Sometimes four. Some people have said one. It's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, there's about 100,000 people, uh, as I understand it, in the state of Missouri that are in the veteran cohort or the veteran class, uh, excessive 100,000 people. Uh, what would you tell them about uh, SB 768? I would say I would love for y'all to look at it, read it, and if, if you agree with it, let your state representative and let your senators know because that's what's going to help. That's what helps. When when you guys came and spoke in committee, that's when people's eyes were opened, right? And they're like, "Oh my gosh, wow!" Um, we had testimony of folks who have been who have been through this. They're like, "Wow, um, that's what we need." Always in government, what I have found is you know public pressure. That's what helps. If you want to get something done, you have to let your representative and your senator know how you feel about it. And they do care. Like, yeah. they represent you. They want to know. What, what do you think about this? What do you know about it? Call them and tell them. Shoot them an email. Tell them. Yeah. But let your voices be heard. That's it. And you've done uh, a substantial amount of years representing the great people of Missouri and uh, as a representative and now as the state senator. Uh, or is that correct? State, yes. State mm -hmm. um, and you have some bigger aspirations, I understand, as the lieutenant governor. I um, do. I'm running for lieutenant governor. Yeah. And, um, you know, and lieutenant governor oversees the veterans programs. And, That's, and, and that, that is important to me. All right. Uh, because you know, we met um, uh, we made an introduction to you uh, by the, an individual by the name of uh, Derek Bloomkey. Yeah. Right? He's our veteran fellow impact fellow on the Grunsell Foundation. And he currently is the chair for uh, the Michigan Governor's Challenge. Uh, and that is uh, a program that is specifically uh, chartered to address veteran suicides within the state of Missouri, uh, Michigan. Is that something that you'd be interested in uh, in the state of Missouri? It absolutely is. And, you know, and, and when he talked about how the lieutenant governors have been on panels and, and working with veterans and suicide, um, I think that is the absolute perfect place. And, and especially with Missouri already having the veterans underneath the, the care, the oversight of the lieutenant governor's office. I mean, I think, you know, not only I, I look at this, but to be able to reach out and be a part of what some of these other states are doing and see where they've gotten, you know, 
further ahead than us. I'm not for recreating the wheel. If somebody's got has figured it out, you know, we need to band together and help our veterans. Yeah. yeah one of the things I always loved about Missouri was their uh, the state motto. Show me. Show me. <laughs> <laughs> right? We, we so well, are. That's right. right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, and you know, where can people find um, your book? So um, Cinder Girl um, by Holly Thompson Raider. On, it's on Amazon. And then um, and then information about me, hollyraider.com. And then I'm also on all the social medias. Fantastic. If there was one thing you wanted to leave the listener of American Grit with, what would that be? I should have thought about this before. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would be um, be active. You know, for years, I didn't, the, the way that I grew up, I didn't know who the president was at times, you know. But this is our country. That's right. And and that's, you know, I ran for office because I, I knew I couldn't sit on the sidelines anymore. I mean, I'm, I, I have a, a pretty strong backbone and, and a big mouth. And so... I couldn't sit on the sidelines anymore. And that's what it takes. It takes normal people, normal people to, to make those phone calls when you see a bill that matters to you, like this one. Yeah. You know, stand up, make a phone call, go up and, and do what you guys have done. You know, going and, and presenting in front of committee and saying, hey, this is how this has changed my life. Because that's what we want to hear. Yeah. We want to know the the real stuff. I want to talk to the people in the trenches. There's no way I could know everything. I don't. Um, I reach out to the people in the trenches and say, "Hey, tell me what you think about this." So speak up. This this is all of our country. That's right. That's right. Well, I appreciate uh, those wise words. And you're absolutely right. I would have never found in my wildest dreams that I would be sitting here, sitting across from a state senator of, of the state of Missouri or sitting in the state of Missouri and, and uh, before the entire Congress and giving a testimony. I never thought any of those things would ever be a part of the cards of my life. But I was somebody that wanted to get involved. I was somebody that said, you know what, I'm tired of seeing what I'm seeing. Uh, and we have to get into the fight, right? And if, it, if it's not me, then who? If it's not now, then when? That's right. And, um, you know, the time is now, and we need everybody to get involved because this, as the senator has said here, that this is our country, and they want to hear from us, and it is your responsibility to reach out to them and let them know what is on your mind and what is going on in your state and what do you think that, you can, uh, that we can accomplish together uh, to make this a better union for all of us. You know, if that's in mental health, if that's in, you know, whatever situation uh, that you believe that is uh, something that needs to be corrected, you can get involved there. So, um, Senator, I want to say thank you very much for coming down to uh, the lovely state of Texas and spending some time with us today and sharing your thoughts. Um, and most specifically, I want to say thank you for your work on SB 768. Um, you know, that is... Uh, you are on the, the cutting edge uh, of, 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 of legislation right now uh, to bring you know, these modalities of treatment to, to Americans, right? So well, I, I appreciate you. Thank you so much and, and for all of the work that you guys do. I mean, it's been tremendous. And, and the advocacy, it is what's going to push this over the line into the governor's desk. So I appreciate y'all. And it's super cool to get to come down here and see everything. <laughs> I love go. it. Well, we're going to have to bring you back again uh, yes. as we continue yes. to monitor your bill and how it moves through Congress. And hopefully uh, by the end of the session, we can have another show and say, hey, we did it. That's uh, right. And, and you got this thing passed. <laughs> and uh, we'll have a great celebration. Uh, but until then, Holly, I want to say thank you so very much. And um, you continue to stand up for what you believe in and, and the people that you that you are uh, uh, representing. So uh, until then, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that is all we have for this installment of uh, American Grit. And um, go find uh, Ms. Holly Thompson Raider's book. It's a great read. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. And um, go out there and support SB 768. And if you're not in the state of Missouri, Find your representatives and show them SB 768 and say, we need something like this in our state so we, we can get the uh, uh, these modalities uh, into our system of government and access to the people. And that's what we're all trying to achieve here is a better outcome for all of us. So until then, ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you again soon. And as always, be kind to one another and wash those stinking hands. We'll see you <laughs> soon. <laughs>